Bergson Holographic Theory of Mind, part two. Again, this is re-recorded from the original to make things a little faster and smoother. So this will be about J.J. Gibson and Bergson. That is how Gibson, the great theorist of perception, has to be put in Bergson's framework, in his holographic framework. We're we'll looking at Gibson's invariance laws, the notion and the fact that these invariance laws from the modulated information that drives the brain as a reconstructive wave in Bergson's framework. So here we go. So a very quick review from what we discussed last time. Firstly, in Bergson's scheme, the universe is holographic. And this holographic field of the universe is a vast interference pattern. It is non-imageable. It looks nothing like the external world we know. Now, note right off the bat, this is not the holographic principle a la Lenny Susskind. And you can see number 39 down in the future for a critique on this. And when we say it looks nothing like, again, we're visualizing a field where everything is interacting, each point with the whole. But as Bergson said, that there are planets, rocks, trees, etc., in this field, certainly. But these do not have the precise outlines we give them. They appear as they do only relative to our scale of time. And of course, any given object, just like any given point, is interacting with all the rest. Then we saw that the brain in Bergson's scheme is a modulated reconstructive wave passing through this holographic field where a little picture of modulated and reconstructive wave up on the right there is uh, we're passing a frequency such as frequency three, a coherent frequency of light wave through that plate and specifying the image, the virtual image of the original source, namely the cup modulate that wave back to, to a frequency one, and we're specifying the object wave originally paired with frequency one, that is the pyramid ball, or modulate the frequency two, and we're specifying the object wave paired with frequency two, the wine glass, or modulate back to frequency three and the cup. So we're modulating the reconstructive wave and specifying various sources, original wave fronts within that plate, the holographic plate. So the brain, analogously, is the modulated reconstructive wave passing through what is in effect a 4D holographic plate, the universal field. And this brain-supported wave, reconstructive wave, is specific to specifying a source in the holographic field. By this process, now an image of this otherwise non-imageable field, the coffee cup on our kitchen table. There is no image of the coffee cup in the brain. Again, the brain slash wave is simply specific to a source in the holographic field. But there is no viewer, no homunculus, we're removing the viewer from that scene inside the brain, looking at the external image. We'll discuss how Bergson removes the viewer in part three. This is the problem of the relation of subject and object. So now to Gibson, a great theorist of perception in psychology. His major works pictured there, the perception of the visual world, first one, 1950. Senses are considered as perceptual systems, 1966, 1979, there, the ecological approach to visual perception. His student, was Robert E. Shaw, was my PhD thesis advisor, and he was the founder of the Journal of Ecological Psychology. And uh, one can see my little book on Amazon, Time and Memory, a Primer, etc. for uh, some of my relationship and uh, work with Shaw. Little, some stories there, shall we say. So for Gibson too, there is no image being generated in the brain. Cross out the image. Now again, as we saw, this is, however, is the standard model of perception. We have receptors re receiving information from the external world, the eyes, the ears. There's an encoder. 
and then that encoding results in the internal world, which of course we know can look nothing like that coffee cup in the first place, which begins the whole hard problem. So the brain, yes, in Gibson's framework, is like a wave. It's resonating to the information from the environment, information being a key word we'll see here. Therefore, the brain is specific to the environment, the coffee cup on the table. Sounds a bit familiar, does it not? Like a holographic process specifying a source in the environment. So let's look at this quote information. So Barclay, roughly 1750, he had noted that the points a, B, C, D, along the top line there, all project to exactly the same spot on the retina. There is nothing is varying on the retina. Therefore, there is no difference between D and A. That is, we cannot see that D is farther away than A or B or C. There is no information for distance in this conception. Gibson pointed out, let's focus on the ground, G1, G2. There, the points in the ground, W, X, Y, Z, via projective transformation onto the red, that preserve the same relative distances, W, X, Y, Z, on the retina. That is, there is indeed information specific to distance on the retina, just reversed. So we're starting to come to Gibson's information, the concept of information. Here is a texture gradient, or field of texture elements. These little elements there. These are ubiquitous. You have blades of grass, the gravel of the driveway, beat sand. And they have a certain mathematical relation. The horizontal separation, the uh, distance between each uh, element within a row, that S, horizontal separation, is proportional to one over the distance. The vertical separation that is between each row is proportional to one over the distance squared, where D is the distance from the observer. Now you can have these as, you can reverse that. They become ceilings or clouds, or stand them on their sides, they become walls. These are ubiquitous in the environment. But again, Note the law, the mathematical law regarding the texture elements. So this texture density gradient is very useful for specifying size constancy. For example, as we move the cup across the gradient, its size appears constant. Now, this is again a law where we have size S, or the height of the cup, times N, and being the number of texture unit rows occluded, always being a constant. For example, in the back row there, we have the cup occluding four rows. Let's say the cup is two units in size. Now, when we look at the forward position, we see it's now occluding four rows, or two rows, but uh, it's doubled in size to four units. So always we have two times four equals eight. That is, we have a, a constancy. Uh, we could call this, make this into a ratio that uh, is always preserved. So an invariance law, again, a, a nice little mathematical law. So the ratio is information. It's used for modulating the hand to grasp the cup. It is the information underlying virtual action. Remember Bergson's principle, perception is virtual action or selecting information from the sea of real actions in the holographic field. And it's being specified as virtual action. Again, the body's capabilities for action being the selection principle from the holographic field. And so this law is underlying the brain's specification of the external world as virtual action. For example, if I'm moving the cup back or forth, backward or forward on the table, that, that my ability to grasp the cup as it's moving is going to be the function of residence, shall we say, to that law, that constancy being specified. 
So if we put this gradient in motion, again, the extra gradient in motion, we get what's termed a flow field. Again, ubiquitous in my experience as we walk or drive down the road. Now, the, the vectors there streaming towards us have a value. The value of each vector or velocity value is proportional to one over the distance squared, d being the distance from the observer. In other words, the fastest moving vectors are closest to the eye. The slower moving vectors are farther away, so smaller arrows. So over these flow fields, there's a value that can be defined term tau. We won't go into the derivation of it, but suffice to say it exists. And the tau ratio specifies the severity of impending impact. So if you're a bird and you're landing on our little airfield there, you're using this value, your action systems are using it to control the uh, hardness or softness of the landing. Or similarly, for a pilot, values critically in controlling action. There's actually also a form of this called grasping tau uh, for modulating the hands and grasping, say, the coffee cup. Again, the severity of uh, impacting the coffee cup. All these, the list we've looked at, are examples of invariance or invariance laws. This is information, this invariance, invariance laws specifying the environment, that is the external world. These laws structure events, that is, they comprise what I like to term event invariance structures. Take our coffee stirring. There is quite a structure there of invariance laws. You have a radial velocity flow field, all of what flow fields we just, we've just looked at. Adiabotic ratios, that is the energy of oscillation over the frequency of oscillation. Inertial tensors, various momenta. Acoustical invariance, texture gradients, ratios, flows, maintaining the size, constancy of the cup, etc. It is the invariance structure from our Gibson framework that is driving the modulation pattern of the specified reconstructive wave. So this is where Gibson most critically fits in to the Bergsonian framework. It's this structure, dynamic over time, that's driving the internal processes of the brain as a reconstructive wave or resonated in Gibson's terms. Now, these flow fields also are critical in specifying form. Note is that stiff flag there would rotate. As it rotates towards us, we'd have an expanding flow field. As it rotates away, a contracting flow field. If we were to take this more generally as a cube rotating, We'll call it a Gibsonian cube. Well, at the top would be a radial flow field. The edges, the vertices, those corners, would simply be sharp discontinuities at the junctures of these flows. Now, there's a problem here, and it's called the aperture problem with with uh, these flow fields are specifying form. Note the grading moving to the right there, and then it moves under the aperture. Okay, well, when, once it moves under that, the line ends are obscured. And all we would see is downward information, only the downward motion. Remembering the aperture is essentially what the eye is. So specification of form via these velocity fields is thus very dicey. There's inherent uncertainties involved in computing the velocities of these lines or these velocity vectors. Again, the eyes are apertures with limited field. Take this rotating ellipse, for example. Okay, it's rigid while rotating at a certain um, speed. Now, thrown into this model that Weiss, Michelin, and Adelson 
described in Nature and Neuroscience 2003, a Bayesian model, you have a probabilistic constraint applied to computing the velocity. This, the constraint is motion is slow and smooth. It becomes a mathematical constraint on the uh, neural network they described. And what you find is if too great a speed, too great a speed of rotation, then this probabilistic constraint, constraint motion is slow and smooth, which is a Bayesian constraint in this framework, is, is uh, it violates this, this constraint. And at high enough rotation speed, then you get a wobbly, distorted, non-rigid figure known as Musadi's illusion. This non-rigidness is related to a similar phenomenon. Take a rotating wire edged cube. So it's simply made of wire edges. It has a symmetry period of four that is carried onto itself or mapped onto itself every 90 degree turn. It looks like it did previously on each 90 degree turn. Now strobe the cube. Now we can strobe it in phase with its uh, symmetry period, that is 4, 8, 12 strobes per revolution, or out of phase, 5, 9, 13 strobes per evolution, revolution. At an integral multiple, 4, 8, 12 per revolution, we get a rigid cube rotating. At a non-integral multiple, 5, 9, 13, a non-rigid, plastically deforming, wobbly, not a cube, it's from my advisor Shaw and, and McIntyre. Now, one could argue or propose that there's a constraint violated here as well, that is possibly temporal symmetry is equal to spatial symmetry. That is, we expect the regular solid, like, like a cube, to be uh, emitting, shall we say, regular pulses, but the uh, a rhythmic strobe is destroying this particular information and this expected constraint. So the lesson here, form is always probabilistic, always an optimal specification based upon the best available information due to the inherent uncertainty of information in velocity flows. The specification of the external field then is always an optimal specification, that is, a probabilistic specification based on the inherent uncertainties in these flows, and therefore on the best information available. And what we'll see down the road, part three, the inherent nature of the flow of time. The, this becomes the ultimate intrinsic source of uncertainty, that is, all specification must be probabilistic based on the very nature of time. So I'll consider there our central picture. We have two scenes that we've recorded, the cube with frequency one, the uh, cup with frequency two. So there's two different interference patterns on that um, holographic plate. Now, suppose we take a reconstructive wave containing frequency one and frequency two and pass it through the hologram. Well, what you're gonna get is a composite fuzzed image, cube slash cup. This will be specified. So the fuzzed cube slash cup is an, an illusion. Well, not actually, this too is an optimal specification based on information in the hologram, based on that reconstructive wave. Given the reconstructive wave, we're specifying, uh, well, what can be specified. Again, assuming there is no omniscient observer. Now, per indirect realist, that is the all in, is in the head advocates, the plastically deforming not a cube is considered an illusion. The non-rigid ellipse would be an illusion. Illusions are considered by these indirect realists the best evidence that, that the image is generated by and is in the brain or the mind. That is, we are not actually seeing the objects quote, where they say they are, as common sense says, in the external field. 
But in this framework, these illusions are simply optimal specifications of sources within the holographic field. I would note the rotating cube over time, in fact, in fact comprises a vast four-dimensional structure. And there is therefore room, so to speak, for different specifications. What have we seen this far? For Bergson, the brain is a modulated reconstructive wave and the wave is specific to sources within the external holographic field. For Gibson, the modulation patterns are driven by the invariance laws, that is the information structuring these external events. For example, velocity vectors, texture gradients, tau ratios, and more. This is how, for Gibson, the specification is affected. This is a definition of information, invariant structure, entirely differing, differing from Shannon's and the computer models, information theory. Neural nets do not embrace this form of information, save in a very approximate kind of statistical way, if at all. Theory failures to deal with this essential form of information structuring events for AI deep learning nets. There's some videos down the road. Information, integrated information theory, higher order thought theory, orchestrated reduction theory, Yosha Bach, Hoffman. These are some of the interesting uh, complete failures to uh, understand this. For both Bergson and Gibson, the image is not within the brain. The brain is simply specific to the external environment. And unsaid, Gibson's model requires Bergson's holographic framework to be understood. For Gibson, the brain is resonating to information, specifying the environment. The brain is therefore specific to the environment. The neural processes underlying or within the resonating brain, we know, look nothing like the coffee cup. But Gibson never explained how the image of the environment actually comes about. He is effectively assuming Bergson's holographic field and the brain as a reconstructive wave. And as we'll see, to make this work, we must have Bergson's temporal metaphysic of space and time. So there's a warning to Gibsonians here. Without Bergson, Gibson makes no sense. See, for example, Stephen Lehar and his analysis of Gibson and direct perception. He can make no sense of it. To quote, this explanation remains as mysterious as the property of consciousness it is supposed to explain. That is our experience of the external world, the coffee cup. Inexplicable in the Gibson's without Bergson framework. He's joined, for example, as we noted by Searle, who who's actually making the theory of direct perception does not even mention Gibson. Chalmers, no mention. Purvis and Lotto, two very influential theorists of color in the perception of external world. According to them, Gibson is seen as mystical. And for derivative problems due to this problem, due to this failure to acknowledge Bergson, you can see number 15. For the whole notion of cognition and thought, is debil and memory is debilitated because of this. To explore down the road. For Gibson, an invariant defined over time, say over a velocity flow, such as those edges and vertices, it cannot be just transmitted as a bit along the nerves. That is, such an invariant does not exist as a static piece of information. It does not exist in a static instant of time. An edge or a vertex of a rotating Gibsonian cube cannot be stored in a static memory as a value or a static feature. For Bergson, there are no instants. Nothing is static. There is only flow. There is only motion. For both current physics, conceptions of space and time are not adequate for psychology, for a theory of mind. That is cognition, memory, perception require a different conception of time. 
Note the quote by Gibson. The abstract analysis of the world by mathematics and physics rests on the concepts of space and time. What does that mean? The Gibsonians have ignored, they have not penetrated the meaning of the statement. The statement is essentially saying they require Bergson's temporal metaphysic, not the standard metaphysics on which physics and mathematics rest. This is critical to your approach to mind. Now we noted in part one that Bergson's model of the brain requires a real concrete dynamics, as concrete as an AC motor generating a field of force. Though it's not an AC motor, obviously. And this is operating in a, in a concrete time, in a concrete flow of time. Not the computer's notion of time. A computer's operations are carried out in an abstract time, in, a, in an abstract space. It is a series of states. No concrete, no particular concrete device or dynamics is required to support the abstract operations. An abacus, a Turing machine with a reed head, an infinite tape, beans and shoe boxes to make a register machine all suffice. As long as the computations, for example, a plus b equals c, are carried out. The operations carry out syntax rules. That is, rules for the concatenation and juxtaposition of objects. Taking that from a little book by Ingerman on the syntax-oriented translator. That definition. That is, note, purely spatial manipulations, the concatenation and juxtaposition of objects. In algebra, it's like A equals B times C, or B equals A over C, or linguistics. In grammar, you have that rewrite rule. A sentence is a concatenation of noun phrase plus verb phrase. And then if you look at the rules there, you see that a verb phrase is a concatenation of a, concatenation of a verb plus a noun phrase. And you have various end elements for verbs and nouns, etc. Again, these are syntax rules, concatenation and juxtaposition of objects, purely spatial operations. Such rules are unaffected by the actual nature or flow of time. They can occur instant to instant, square to square on a Turing machine tape. It doesn't matter whether time is extremely fast or geologic. The same computational result is achieved. The actual nature of time is irrelevant. The operations are scaleless, but there are many possible scales of time. You have the buzzing fly, its wings perceived as a blur of normal scale, but you could have a scale where the fly is flapping its wings like a heron, or a scale where the fly has become a cloud of swirling electrons. Again, what we'll see, the brain's chemical dynamics, the dynamics underlying the reconstructive wave, underlies the specification of the scale of time. It's interesting, like number 44 and number 57, with respect to LSD. But the operations, the computer operations, these abstract operations proceed instant to abstract instant. They do not require that the instants be in any way connected, continuous, melding into one another, organically glued together. Only the abstract operations are required and only these. The buzzing fly is a specification of the past. From the time the light hits the retina and processes through the brain, the hundreds of wing beats comprising the blurred perception of the fly have long ago come and gone. How is past specification possible? The buzzing slash moving fly, the rotating cube are time extended dynamically changing forms. You perceive a past continuous motion. We see the rotation, we see the buzzing. What is the memory that supports dynamically changing forms? What glues the instance together such that we see this continuous motion? As we noted, the computer's operations proceed by operation by operation. 
state to state, instant to instant. There is no actual continuity. The glue is undiscussed. But cognitive science views the brain the same way. Both AI and cognitive science and physics share an underlying metaphysic on space and time. So how do we perceive or explain the continuity, the time extension of perceived motions? What is the glue of the instance? How do we see that? How do we perceive continuous motion? Is there a form of memory underlying perceived events, or putting it differently, how does memory support a dynamic form? For current science, the question of memory is always a question of storage. How do we store that rotating cube as an event in the brain? Because that's what's supposed to happen. How does the brain store the velocity flows defining a rotating cube or any event? Our coffee stirring, for example, same problem. Velocity flow fields, tons of motion. How to store by storing samples in the brain? Well, this was Barcelo's example solution. Take a biting transformation, like the face there biting a carrot. And we'd store that as three schematic image-like states shown, shown above. So biting a carrot in the brain goes these three schematic states. But biting is actually a facial flow field. Take a look at a few facial flow fields. In fact, an actual carrot being eaten. These are as hard to store as the rotating cube or the coffee stirring. Again, those flow fields. But each state or sample is a static point, like, you, like laying out three snapshots laid out in a row sitting on a desktop. But the desktop is some form of spatial short-term memory store. So how is the motion reconstructed from that? By some internal scanner that scans the static snapshots to impart motion. But this is an infinite regress. How does the scanner registrate motion? Via yet another scanner? Then another, ad infinitum, not going to work. This is the lesson of the strobe rotating cube. A strobe is a sample. But what we saw is a single strobe that is a sample is not sufficient to specify form. When the strobe was out of phase, five, nine, 13 strobes for rotation, no single sample that is strobe in the sampling series specified a rigid cube. To note here, trying to account for the registration of motion, that is events, via some static memory store, upon which there is some form of integration, that is, gluing of all these things so we get motion of, stat of the static samples that is states. Remember, we're always talking really the same thing in terms of states. This is absolutely ubiquitous in the literature. Let's take one additional example. Take this situation. We have a cube and a cone. And we it's, consider it as composed of features, vertices, edges cone and the cube. But if the features are now stored separately, how are they put back together? For the features can come back together in multiple ways. This is noted by Hummel and Biederman in 1992. That is, how does the system know to bring these jumbled stored features back as a cube or as a cone rather than any other thing? So the problem with features to begin with is called the correspondence problem. As the cube rotates or the tree grows, for example, here we have a growing tree. You must track the features from frame to frame or from snapshot to snapshot or state to state. 
but the problem was determined to be intractable. Hence the move, which we have already seen, to computing form in terms of velocity flow fields. They quit tr trying to track features, separate features. So it's a given that a photograph of the cube or the coffee cup is not found in the brain. Never going to find it. So there is discussion of dis disassembling the event into these features and storing these in separate areas in a short-term memory. Yep, even each biting face, of all the different faces we saw, must be broken down to a set of static features. And the features must now be reassembled as the event. Now, when the cube is rotating or our uh, buddy there is eating the carrot, these static features, because memory, everything is going into memory, then being reconstructed, we must be disassembled and reassembled again and again, instant after instant after instant in real time. But we're back to the question, how to put these features back together? How is the reassemble even done? Hummel and Biedermann proposed the composition of the geons, where geons were bricks, coaches, co cones, and wedges. And the event is recomposed from these. But the geons were like, like nice, the nice handy picture on top of the puzzle box. Very handy. And somehow you would have had to have the tag that all these features are related to the, uh, this this uh, particular picture, but or handy puzzle box feature. But there's just innumerable problems with this. But let's take the most salient. The features in the Gibsonian cube we saw were simply sharp discontinuities at the junctures of flows. The features do not exist without the flows. They are invariants over flows. In other words, the static storable features that Hummel and Biederman were considering do not even exist. That is, the storage problem is way worse than they think. So all this is just another form of sampling, taking snapshots, static, static snapshots of the event. A neural network would be taking samples of the rotating cube. The non-rigid, plastically deforming, not a cube shows this. This is the lesson. Sampling, the storing samples, the storing states, does not work. To specify a rigid cube, the sampling must be in phase with the symmetry period. But now the net would need precognition to know the rotation rate of that cube. And what if there were two or three cubes rotating at different rates? Bottom line, there is no discussion of how the brain stores velocity flows, nor any engagement with these problems whatsoever. Thus the wisdom of Gibson's statement, to quote, for where is the borderline between perceiving and remembering? Where do percepts stop and begin to be memories? Or in another way of putting it, go into storage. The facts of memory are supposed to be well understood, but these questions cannot be answered. This entire problem stems from what we'll term the classic metaphysic, or the spatial metaphysic of space and time, at the heart of physics and mathematics, which Gibson warned against, and for which Bergson created an explicit temporal alternative. So we move on where we'll go in part three, as we've been tuned up to the problem of time. In part three, the specified image is an image of the past you've seen. This is where the optical problem, the problem of image creation, becomes also a problem in physics model of time. When we see a fly buzzing by, his wings beating 200 beat times per second, we are seeing a blurred summation of an already past history of the fly's motion. We are seeing the fly as a past transformation of a yes, small portion of the external holographic field. How is this past specification possible? 
Here we're going to have to bring in Bergeson's model of time. As noted in part one, we must also remove the homunculus, the lurking concept of a little man that sits in the brain and views the projected image. Something, by the way, you will almost never see a solution to the hard problem address. This moves us too deeply into the problem of time. We must come to, come to understand this koan, the Zen koan, shall we say, of Bergson's. The questions related to subject and object to the distinction and their union must be put in terms of time rather than of space. So next time, we'll be discussing the classic spatial metaphysic, Bergson's temporal metaphysic, scales of time and perception, how we see the past, the relation of subject and object, all of which comprises Bergson's very unique, never discussed form of panpsychism. Down the road, we'll talk about what is thought, what is cognition, Bergson's implications for AI and the singularity, why do AIs need and will never have explicit memory, uh, and is why is consciousness required for cognition? Free will, voluntary action, implications of education, evolution, cognition, and consciousness, and Bergson versus Einstein and relativity. Till then, till next time, signing off.